Entrepreneurship has always been absolutely critical um, in the history of business and also for society at large. If you look at all the large businesses that we talk about today, like Microsoft and GE and many others, they all come from a startup, if you will. A startup pre- play three critical roles, the three I's. Number one is around innovation. And number two is around investment. And the third one is the interplay with the established business. Let me expand on all of those. On innovation, we all know, right, companies are very good at taking advantage of new technology and pushing the boundaries. We've heard stories of 3M, Southwest Airline, um, and then um, uh, GE, for example. But research also shown they're very good at incremental innovation to really lowering the costs, up the scales, and being very competitive in the market. And that leaves a whole set of area around disruptive innovation, and mostly a lot of times for the startups. In the past decades, we've seen the rise of new digital tech. We've seen the rise of social media. All of these has been challenging the established industry and business. And therefore, startups play a critical role in disruption. And because of that disruption linked to a huge risk uh, uh, that is many a time not palatable for the established business. What we've seen is about 90% of the startup fail eventually, only about 1% win the IPO. So a lot of these, right, make it very, very difficult for that established business to innovate and then pass their own internal hurdle rate. And what we've seen over the time is there is this ecosystem, right, um, that bringing a lot of fundings over the years. We've basically seen about north of 60 uh, billions of, of dollars poured into this investment from angel investing to VC to PE. And that really has a different risk profile for this investment to really jump into this early technological development and also developing the market. That leads to the third very important notion is what's the interplay or the relationship between startup and the established business. And what we've seen over the years is the established business have a hard time internalizing some of these innovations. For example, we've seen in healthcare, uh, a lot of the early biotech development has been outsourced to universities or biotech firms. And that relationship becomes very, very important. We leave the entrepreneurs to de- develop the early te- stage technology and develop in the market where the later um, established firm will jump in and really help it scale up. So it's very, very important for business and society in general for entrepreneurs to play the role of innovating, have a higher risk but higher reward in terms of investment, and also play a complementary role to the existing business. In the past decades, digital technology really set up great opportunities for startups to flourish. Most recently, we heard about ChatGPT by OpenAI, but there are a lot of other examples really make a vibrant startup ecosystem. So in general, digital does a few things to startup ecosystem. Number one is with the abundance of digital technology and accessibility, it really democratizes this notion of entrepreneurship or startup. And with a lot of companies helping startup, you have the AWS, you have the Shopee's, a lot of individual entrepreneurs can really easily start a company in their backyard, have access to the new tools, and really be able to build up their business in real, uh, in, in very fast fashion through social media. So that accessibility and democratization is absolutely critical to this vibrant ecosystem. And that leads to a second part, right? So we, there's a lot of disruptions uh, to the e- existing landscape. Therefore, the existing business actually jump in to take advantage of this. They understand the risk profile make them very difficult to jump in on innovation themselves. And therefore, we've seen a lot of companies providing incubators, accelerators for startup. That ecosystem building also accelerated uh, the growth of the startup, if you will. Um, and then a, a third one is there provides a lot of niche, right? So I've worked very heavily with Google around the globe in Asia, in, 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 in Europe. What they've done is have very effectively built a system for a lot of startup or mid-sized company to help them activate 
their digital tools. So now we also seen with the generative AI company are scratching their heads and say, how do I train my people? How do I use the system? How do I activate my SAP that I just put into places or the cloud system? So a lot of startups play in this niche and play in this service space to actually provide those. So in general, digital have a huge opportunity to provide it to a lot of the companies. But research also showed, and I would also caution, when you open up the floodgate, a lot of people can start a company. That means somewhat that success rate actually can be decreased because there's a lot of Me Too product, there's a lot of copying, and therefore it is very critical for startup to think about how can I find a niche to actually have a competitive advantage. Their statistics show only about 1% startup when IPO in the United States, around 10% startup will eventually succeed. And that's exactly the reason. You may have an easy time setting it up, but getting to success is not that easy. We talk about the great opportunities that have been studying digital for the past decade. What we've seen is this waves of technology coming in. Each wave will create a lot of opportunity for startup. That start with IoT and that basically help company really change their hardware and try to think about how do we get all the data together. Move into blockchain, which is a different way to organize the data, provide trust and security. And then we have seen the spin off of Bitcoin coming out of those and digital currency. And that later on move into the traditional ML and machine learning and AI to help company organize the information and generate insight. Now to today, we see this new wave around generative AI. What we've seen as a general tendency is what we call the flavor of the year. <laughs> so if you go around, which I did with a lot of incubators, with a lot of VCs, and try to invest in this company, you see company really move along with this technology because technology become more accessible. However, the challenge is the longer term success for these are really, really unproven, right? Uh, you can jump in with a technolo technological opportunity, but how can you find the value? How can you make that success is a different story. And therefore, what we encourage company to do is to think around three angles. Number one, what is the unique value you provide regardless of the technology or even within the technology context? Number two is can you pivot and become agile that go with the technology? Right, And there are recent article written about uh, the SaaS model may be outdated. How do we actually think about new business model? And the third one is how do you actually really understand the market? And how do you discover the value that is really valuable uh, to the firms and to the general audience? And that will give you that unique play for longer term success. And we've seen some estimates about 14% of the people actually 14% uh, of the startup actually failed because they didn't understand the market, didn't really market well, and therefore that discovery of the value is critically important. This is a forever challenge for business. Uh, we have the tension that's articulate in the, the 20s and 60s around this exploration versus exploitation. Established business are very good at scaling, standardization, cost advantage, and scale. So they're on the exploitation side. And the entrepreneurs are typically on innovation, the exploration side. They're really good at developing technology, developing the market, and so on and so forth. And that creates a tension that established business have a hard time incorporating innovation, and entrepreneurs have a hard time scaling because running a less than 100 people team where you know everyone is completely and fundamentally different from running a 300 people organization or running a few thousand that spread around different geographies. So many of the entrepreneurs struggle with the notion of how do you run a organization and how do you scale up. And there are a few things to consider. Number one is really trying to think about the mechanism through which you scale up, right? Is it being acquired, you leverage some existing resources, or you want to go IPO? And the path to which to actually you, you grow up through organic or inorganic is actually very, very different. And therefore, partly it's very, very important for organization to understand your unique value, what you provide, and where you lack the resources. 
And in digital in particular, we've seen this well-articulated notion of the winner takes all. Therefore, time is the essence. And many entrepreneurs will actually hold on to their baby and say, I'm just going to grow it organically. But they could be very quickly and easily eaten up by a large incumbent or by another um, uh, startup who has the resources. And therefore, understanding your growth mechanism and really jump on to uh, leverage the scale and, and grow in that digital economy become very, very important. A lot of the investors looking at entrepreneurship or startup based on this su super successful example like Google, like Amazon, like Jawbox, etc. And famously, right, uh, founder of Plug and Play, which is one of the largest tech center in the U.S., was an early investor in Jawbox. And therefore, a lot of these in the, this investment pushing entrepreneur to this angle of a B2C. The notion combined with the technology with a global access is if you can tap into a real challenge into the B2C world with the global scale provided by technology, then you can be a mega company. However, that is a great dream that creates a lot of unicorns, but it's far from the reality that we live in. Therefore, a lot of the company, especially at the early struggle of founding and then finding out a unique product design, went through the B2B route. Right? Here we know quite a few examples. The most famous would be Blah Blah Car. Really went into the B2C route for car sharing as a pioneer, but had to go through a B2B route to understand how do you design the product to make the both sides of the market work and how do you actually find a business model. They went through a seven different business models in order to figure out how do you charge and how do you actually make sure the operation run. We've seen very, very similar examples in other space where a company went between this B2C, uh, sorry, B2C route and this SaaS model that serves B2B. So that's something as companies scale, you should start to consider this short term. How do you keep it viable, give you the resource to discover the market and design a product versus a longer term dream that you can conquer the world? Uh, many of the successful uh, examples actually come from the B2B world where they find a niche and they can have a space to themselves. As technology keeps evolving, there is increasing expectation for the entrepreneurs to be tech savvy and understand the different technologies and also not only have the depths and the technology, but the application. But what we've seen from research um, over the decades is the founder composition in terms of capabilities are actually very, very important. Although we know from a practice world, co-founder might be challenging, but the founding team really needs three main buckets of knowledge or capability. Number one is certainly around technology, right? If you are a technology-driven firm, understanding the deep technology, either scientifically or um, as generative AI from sort of engineer or, um, um, or algorithm point of view is absolutely critical to build the core of the product. At the same time, you do need a second leg of a very important knowledge is around market, right? Can you have run a process to discover the market need? Can you understand how deep the need is? Can you pivot as you discover new trends and needs uh, from the market? And can you actually understand the competitive landscape? What has been done with the established firm? And where are your niche? And how can you take advantage of the technology to develop the market? Is a very, very important second leg. And the third leg, as we talk about company scaling, it is important to basically see, can I mobilize the investment community? Can I have the, uh, the critical resources? And can I actually allocate the resource internally in the right way? I've been mentoring a lot of startups. What we've seen is if the companies, the founders especially, are very cognizant and be strategic about the three pillars, they tend to become very successful, right? In a lot of the times when startup talking with established business, if you're B2B or talking with the market, technology is taken for granted. We want technology to be there. We want you to have a unique 
take around the technology, but that should be hidden from the users and user, users should have the technology as simple, accessible and easy to deploy. And therefore, although technology is very, very critical, the founding team need to balance the three around technology, around the market needs and around the investment and resources.